Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, October 11, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. I promise to make it worth your while today, especially in light of these market conditions. So what are we talk about? Well, I left this in from last week. Trick or treat, welcome to October. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt, a cause for concern. One thing that I was talking about with my service peeps early in October and late September was that my gut was that we'd see the expansion of volatility in October, which is no big shocker because there's always an expansion, usually in October, of volatility. And the other thing was that we could just see a big shakeout. Now, I don't know if that was intuition or intuition, as they say in market wizards, but as usual, you have to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. We're going to pick apart all that too. So I'm going to say the word you should never say. Hopefully, hopefully this is just a big shakeout and the market can resume its longer term trend. We'll take a look at all that in a lot of details. Now, also, if you have some questions on trading, two things. One, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides until we get to the live charts, and then you can ask about anything you want. And if we have to backtrack a little bit, no problems. And then along a similar vein, wait until we get to the live charts before you ask about stocks. And when you do, and this is for your benefit, just ask about one stock at a time. So what are we going to talk about? Well, knowing and keeping it simple, and that's going to make a lot more sense in a few minutes. And also, can you be successful with just the basics? And of course, the elephant in the room now is the market, obviously, and we have potential major sell signals in the works. And I want to talk about those, go over a few things in the slides, and then when we get to the actual markets, we're going to pick it apart. And it's pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. Sometimes I forget to give him credit on that. So I'm not going to go through all the details on this market timing system because that's covered in a lot more detail in the learning management system. Also just recently published an article for Proactive Advisor magazine where I went into the details of the system. I'm going to give you the rules today. We're just not going to spend a lot of time going through a lot of the details and you can find them under market timing under the members courses on my website. So just real quick, over the years my goal has been to simplify things after going through the grail hunts like we all do. And one thing that I keep coming back to is in technical analysis, first of all, the only way to ever make money on a trade is to capture a trend. I guess I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. But with technical analysis, the reason technical analysis works is because there's a hard and fast concrete rule. If a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to pass through B along the way. Now, as I often say, you can't just buy at B except the few caveats in IPOs, which we actually do look to do just that. My point is that you're better off trying to buy at B than when the market's on its way down trying to catch a bottom. Because remember, as a trend follower, the only way to make money is to capture a trend. As a trader, the only way to make money is to capture a trend. People lose sight of that. In a Q&A session yesterday, somebody had asked me, am I worried that too many people would follow my system because I'm traveling the world speaking the good merits of my system? And my answer was no, because one, the only way to make money trading is to capture a trend. So trend following will never go out of style. And two, everybody will often put their own tweaks on things and try to beat the system or go off to chase rainbows becomes because some guru out there claims to have the Holy Grail, which he doesn't. I'm going to be careful because I don't want to digress too far. Anyway, getting back to the ABC thing, trading as easy as ABC or technical analysis as easy as ABC or trend following as easy as ABC as I think 
was the title of the Proactive Trader magazine. At least that, at least that's how it got retitled. He tried to say. The point was, if a market is to go beyond C, it's going to have to go from somewhere around C and beyond. So if you buy somewhere between B and C, what the hopes, and I know I should use the word hopes, we're going to talk a little bit about money management in a minute, but your hopes are that by trading with the trend, that market will go beyond C. Not beyond say, but beyond C. So stay long, as long as a market is near or around C. And when a market drops below near C, okay, or somewhere around B on the way back down, then you might want to consider, number one, exiting, of course. But number two, you might also want to consider shorting if you're a little bit more advanced. Now, maybe you, now would be a good time for me to touch upon shorting a little bit. So when we get to the charts, I'm going to talk a little bit about shorting. Now that I'm thinking about it, it's probably good for the people who are pouring up to speed on shorting. I'm not a huge fan of shorting, but I will do it because I am a trader and that's what I do. And there's a couple other reasons other than just to make money. And that's the only way to make money on the short side. Anyway, before I digress too far, let's get back to this little system here. Now, if you want a guarantee, you should do what? Buy a toaster. But this silly little simple system, something I cannot believe how simple it is, and how great it works would have kept you out of every major bear market in history. Now, you would have got beaten up a little bit going in, just like you would be right now if this thing turns out to be something much bigger. But before it got really, really ugly, 80 and 90 percent drops, such as back in the Depression and 60, 70 percent drops in the Nasdaq, you would have gotten out long before that. And it would also would have kept you in the majority of the big bull market, sometimes keeping you long for years and years. So I'm going to give you the rules here just really, really quick. You want to buy when two lows are greater than a 50-week moving average. That's upside day of light. And the market is near C. Near C is defined as, for this example, with market indices, specifically the S&P 500, as long as the market is 10% away from those 50-week highs, you want to stay long. And then you want to sell or sell short when the market drops more than 10% away from C, C being the 50-week high, remember that, and closes below the 50-week moving average. Now, we're not waiting for downside Dave light because they slide faster than they glide. Now, you pilots just don't let your eyes glaze over or whatever. I know that, that a glide technically is lower, but in this case, I'm saying gliding higher versus sliding low old wall street adage take the what is it take the escalator up and the elevator down okay and we're seeing a little bit of that elevator action now so here's the system in action notice that the market is greater than 10 percent away from its 50 week moving average and down here i have a little indicator programmed and my indicators are available free in Metastock. And I have the Dave Light indicator program, which is pretty cool. And I've, I've had a lot of fun messing around with that. And that could really help to keep you on the right side of the market. And that's, again, free with Metastock. And then the ribbon bar I program myself down here using some of their code and modifying it, I think, if memory serves. And then I've created this little indicator up here to tell me how far away from the high that I am. Now, this is off. I've named it 250 because it was a 250 day high. But in this case, we're using a 50 week high. So we're going to be bearish as long as there's day light, meaning that the lows are below the 50 week moving average. And we're going to be considered we're going to consider the market bullish as long as what? The lows are greater than the 50-week moving average, meaning that we have upside Dave Light, and we're within 10% of those 50-week highs. Now, I would encourage you to go out and do your own research on this. Maybe use longer-term highs to see how that works. Maybe use shorter-term highs to see if it would generate more signals, maybe get you in a little earlier or whatever. See how bad the whipsaw would be on that. 
and that I think that'd be great fodder for research. Now, my little ribbon I programmed here to be neutral as long as we were within 10% of the highs, but still below the moving average, or let's see, what else? As long as there was... Um, or intersecting the moving average, okay? So either no daylight to the downside and less than 10% or intersecting the moving average. So, and the reason I programmed that in is so if the market got choppy, it just kind of chopped around the moving average, you wouldn't get signals that just remained in that neutral mode. But once you were to get two days of the daylight, let me go in the right direction here, to the upside and the market was less than 10% away from its 50 week moving highs, then you would go ahead and buy. So that would be a buy signal right there. And notice you have upside Dave light as this new trend begins. It doesn't always start a new trend, but this is what it looks like when it does. And as I discussed in prior presentations, there will occasionally be whipsaws, as Greg Morris said. He was visited a couple of years back, and we got to talk about markets, of course. <laughs> after a couple of beers, we talk about markets. Uh, well, before a couple of beers, we talk about markets. After a couple of beers, we tell raunchy jokes. But anyway, he said, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. And I think he wrote that in Investing with the trend, which is a good book, I'd suggest you read. Now, Greg, by the way, I was asked this uh, recently. Greg does go into a little bit more details when it comes to market timing. You got to realize that Greg was running $5 billion and he was more of a kind of a big picture guy and he only traded ETFs, okay? Because once you start running a few billion dollars, you can't really rush out and pick a bunch of individual stocks. What's his name? Peter. I can never think of his name. Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch years ago tried to do that with Magellan Fund, and eventually it became harder and harder and harder, and the fund became too big. You could no longer go out and find his little inefficiencies. But anyway, long story endless, the point is that, yes, Greg has a little bit more advanced market timing, which I really haven't studied in a whole lot of detail. I did read his book, but I haven't gone out and done my own due diligence. And that's mostly because... I prefer to keep it simple and just use simple little silly systems like this to keep me in the market. And the other thing, too, is a lot of my research is empirical. Greg's not looking at 2,000 stocks every day. He's looking at some ETFs. But I'm looking at all these stocks, and I covered this in a lot more detail in the market timing again. But I'm looking at all these stocks, and I'm beginning to see the deterioration, deterioration the debacle de jours, and so on and so forth. And then I go through two or 300 sectors. I think 300 sectors, 240, 39 um, morning store industry groups, plus a few other ETFs. So it's roughly two to 300, whatever the number is. And I could see what's going on there. And we're going to take a look at what I call the major, well, what they call the major mix in just one second. And you'll see that type of empirical type of research. But yeah, Greg is applying some advanced decline and some other more advanced type of things. And he's actually known for that. But keeping it simple, here's the system again, and this is one example of a bearish move. I think this is, uh, yeah, this is the, the Great Depression, okay? And you could see that going into the stock market crash, where was the market? Well, it was near C, okay? Certainly above B, less than 10% away from those all-time highs. And I think I used closing highs on this. And you also had Dave Light, okay? And notice that the ribbon down here was bullish. But then notice what happened. The market ended up greater than 10% away from those 250 week, I'm sorry, 50 week highs. And then also notice that the market closed below the 50 week moving average, okay? So that would be a sell signal, and it also flips the ribbon to bearish. Now, the market went on to lose, if you look at those prior presentations I did on this, I think it lost about 83% from that level. It's 
pretty impressive. It seems like a lot to give up, that last 10% in the end. But if you had a pretty good run, if the market's up several hundred percent, and, and in the end you give up a little a little move, like 10%, I know, a little move, haha. But then you avoid another 80% to the downside, or 70% in the case of the NASDAQ, or 40-something percent in the S&P twice over the last 20 years, then you're doing pretty darn good. And then you get back in. Eh, it takes a little time to get back in. You will miss a little bit of that bull leg. But the good news is, if it truly is a longer term, two, three hundred percent bull leg, then you'll be in plenty early enough. Remember, it's trend following. You first must have a trend to follow in order to follow the trend. I know, duh, but you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends, pick bottoms, and a host of other really bad behaviors. So here's just kind of an idea of the bullish bearish ribbon down here. As long as you have the Dave light and as long as you are what? Within 10% of those highs, you're going to be bullish. And it gets neutral when? Well, when you begin to dip below that moving average and you no longer have that Dave light. Now, as I said earlier, whipsaws are frustrating. The signal back here, it looked pretty darn ugly way back in 2016. Okay. But what happened? That that was not, that did not turn out to be the mother of all tops. So what? What do we say? What do we used to say? What did I used to say in the hedge fund world? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. That's one thing I learned after spending 14 years working with a hedge fund. And you can see that once it turned bullish again, except for one little neutral bar in there, it stayed, or actually another little neutral bar earlier this year. It stayed bullish for a long, long, long time. In fact, believe it or not, it's still bullish. So this is what we need to focus on today is where are we with this system? And when we get to the live charts, we'll take a look at that. Now, any questions on that system before we move any further? I just want to kind of set it up for you so when we look at the live charts, we can analyze it with that in the back of our mind. I also want to take a look at weekly bow ties and other things like that. Down almost 40 points in the P's could be a problem. Well, I'm down 31 points, but I hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing I want to revisit is, can you be successful with just the basics? And I did a presentation on this, I think it was a couple of years ago. I found some slides that I did. And in working on this learning management system, it's really been, it's really been super helpful for me. I know it's going to be super helpful for for you, because in my case, even though I feel like I've gained all this knowledge, it's forced me to go back in and look at everything really hard. And it's really making me focus just on the basic, basics. And it's also making me very cognizant of how crazy emotional I am. And by the way, you are too. And over the last couple of weeks, we did some presentations on being cognizant and how I'm now a lot more cognizant of my F-bombs and things like that. So the question is, can you be successful with just the basics? Now, before we get into that, we all go through this cycle. You don't know that you don't know. Then you know that you don't know. And then you know. Now, I've been noodling with this for a long, long time. And I realize that others have done a lot of research here. So after I got through drawing my little chart, I did a little poking around the net, and I found that two psychologists actually have published studies on this way back in the 90s. And we'll get to that in just one second. But what happens is when you first start trading, you begin to absorb everything like a sponge. And what happens is you think you know but you don't. So, but initially you're learning a whole bunch and what you actually know is actually going up really, really quick. Unfortunately, as I often preach, 
the slow type is bounces don't count. I don't get it. So, oh, I got you. So the, <laughs> yeah, he was trying to, he was trying to say that uh, we're down 40 points and then the market must have jumped nine points in the meantime. All right. I don't want to digress too far. So let me just stop reading the comments. So my ADD doesn't kick in. We'll get back to them in one second. So anyway, when you come into learning about the markets, you begin soaking up everything like a sponge and your knowledge goes up exponentially. And what you know or what you think you know about that knowledge goes up exponentially too. Unfortunately, what happens is, as I often preach, the market could be a bad teacher. And what you think you know continues to grow exponentially. And this is where you get into a lot of trouble. And as I said a minute ago, the psychologists have a better way, a more eloquent way of, of putting it. And we'll get to that in one second. And in some cases, what you actually know actually begins to decrease. You might have a small epiphany here and there. But unfortunately, a lot of times what you think you what you actually know decreases while what you think you know increases. And this is what's really dangerous. And this is an ongoing theme that I do in a lot of these presentations. The people who design systems in perfect hindsight and have never traded the actual system and they have 50%, sometimes even more, believe it or not, drawdowns. And that's in perfect hindsight, okay? And as I often preach, your biggest drawdown is always in front of you with a purely mechanical system. And as I've said ad nauseum, I told that once to a mechanical system designer and he started screaming at me and I'm thinking that poor bastard <laughs> does not realize what's going to happen to him sooner or later when things begin to change even just a little bit. And he has that huge drawdown, much bigger than what he's ever seen. Now, before I digress too far, you will over time have little tiny epiphanies and your learning will end up looking something like this. And the true enlightenment will come when you kind of reach, it's kind of funny, I call it the point of despair. And this is exactly what the psychologists call it. It's kind of like you, you reach this point of total frustration where you're like, crap, I really don't know anything about the markets. And believe it or not, at that point in time, you actually know more than you think you know. And that's when the true enlightenment happens. And when these two lines come back together and you kind of slowly grow out and you have a little epiphany along the way and you'll flatten out. But net net, what you actually know and what you think you know will become congruent and you're out here somewhere. Keeping it simple, following the trend, using stops, looking at things like persistency and say, wow, that's pretty cool. Wow, look, acceleration with persistency and minor epiphanies for me like Hey, persistency is not only cool longer term, but over the short term, it could be pretty darn useful. For instance, in a transitional pattern, if the market is going up day after day after day after day after major lows and you get a bow tie, for instance, let me show you this. And I, I don't want to digress too far, but let me just show you a couple of little mild epiphanies that I've had. And I'll show you one that I might be onto something Again, so let's say that you've got a market bottoming out like this, okay? And then let's just let's just put it as price bar so you can see it. So let's say you have a market that's just dropping and dropping and dropping, it bottoms out, and then all of a sudden starts doing this. It starts going up day after day after day after day. Well, even four or five days of persistency, which I've discovered in more recent times, I say more recent times, it's 2008, I think, when I was in Italy looking up at a 30-foot screen, I noticed that, wow, these little moves are pretty important. Anyway, minor epiphanies like, look at that, little persistency here, pretty cool thing. One thing that I might be on to in more recent times, in other words, yesterday, as I was putting a lesson into the system, and I was talking about box stocks in the, in the learning management system under stock selection, and I was basically saying, you know, a la Darvis, if you have these stocks, you want to see them to make boxes over boxes over boxes. And one thing that I noticed in all my examples were that you had nice persistent moves higher 
between those boxes. So I think I'm on to something here. So that's another one of those little mild epiphanies, but it's a simple mild epiphany. When you first start out, you're searching for complexity, it looks like that. And then now I'm trying to avoid complexity and my search for simplicity looks like this. What could be more simple than drawing a line through the bars and looking for that Darvish style box to build on top of that Darvish style box? What could be more simple than buying an IPO at B while it's on its way to C? So those are the little minor epiphanies that I come up with over the years. And I'm also having a lot of little psychological epiphanies in working on the learning management system because there's tons and tons of psychology that are going into that. And as I preached last week, becoming more and more and more cognizant of my emotions. And I keep threatening to keep a little pad and, and, and X off how many F-bombs that I drop. And I've been more and more cognizant of that. And I'm actually scaled back a little bit over the last week or so. A couple of days ago, I had a stock beginning to implode a little bit on me. I'm dropping F-bombs. Well, I noticed that now their other stock was up modestly, but based on the position sizing on the money management, net net, I was actually up a little bit. So here I am in my office screaming F-bombs like a madman, and I was actually making money. Well, I'll take making money any day. Doesn't work that way every day, obviously. I wish it did. You know, some more five hours ago. <laughs> so doing a little Googling along this learning management thing, learning curve management, I'm sorry, doing a little Googling on learning curves, I stumbled across this Dunning-Kruger Kruger effect, okay? And I um, probably will do a little bit more research in there. I searched through all my psychology journals here, and I couldn't find anything on these two gentlemen. So I might have to see if they've written any books or anything and do some follow-up research. But their point, their learning curve, or they have a name for this curve. I forget the exact name. for. Oh, it's a Dunning-Kruger effect, okay? So on the left side, you have confidence. On the right side, you have wisdom. And what happens is you reach that peak of Mr. Stupid, and you drop down to this valley of despair. Well, that's part of the learning curve. That's part of the cycle that you go through. And we all go through this, and we all have to live through that. It's just a fact of life. The problem is many give up right around here. Now, as I preach, if we just take something really simple and follow it, such as TKOs and trends and persistency, the acceleration and watching the overhead supply and things like that, then you will flatten out this curve and just have slow growth throughout. And maybe it'll look more like this. It'll go straight up and then like that. But for some reason, we all have to go through that grail hunt. Now, if you could get through the valley of despair, as Mr. Dunning and Mr. Kruger suggest, or call it, I should say, then that's when the true wisdom comes along, and then you have the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of sustainability. They call it guru here. I don't like that word very much. So I would just say uh, successful TFM, maybe. And it takes a long time to realize what you don't know. Now, along the lines of what you don't know, I've done many presentations on this, and I have four or five, I think, behind the learning management system where I say, talking, quoting, uh, what's the king's name? Tyron? Tywin? Tywin. From Game of Thrones, he was supposed to be like the wise king and the richest king in the nation. A wise king knows what he knows and what he does, and as he's talking to his son, who will inherit the throne. Well, that's sage advice for a trader. A wise trader knows what he knows and what he doesn't. And I have to say, it's very humbling and and this is why I get so mad at these people that make it look like you just push a button, get a peanut, and you can make all this money. I, you get all these emails. I just made $10,000. I haven't eaten, even eaten breakfast yet. It's like, well, <laughs> what, 
what did you do? This is on Monday. I get this email. Well, what did you do on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? Like in the Godfather, you know? Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday. What did you do on those other days? <laughs> so be careful of the false profit. Trading is hard work, and it's amazing how humbling it could be even after you've been at it for a while. I just read, as I said recently, I helped or been helping Linda Rasky proof her new book, which I would recommend you read. She's still working on the title, so it's not even – it hasn't even been released yet. But in reading that, it made me feel really normal for screaming F-bombs, for getting bummed out, and all these other emotions. Just because you decide to become a trader and do it for a long, long time doesn't mean that those emotions go away. So you should feel normal if you're struggling. In fact, if you're struggling and you're not giving up, that might be a, a sign that you're getting it. Now, if you feel like it's easy, then you might be at the top of that peak of stupidity. So I would caution you to be careful. So along the lines of this Socratic reasoning, Mark Twain was attributed to saying, and, and there's some controversy or whether he said it or not, this I think was a line from The Big Short, which if you haven't seen it, I'd, I'd recommend you watch the movie before I digress too far. It's not what you know, it's what you know that isn't so. And that's where you get into a lot of danger. And then Socrates, again, something that's attributed to him, but maybe not that it didn't actually say some other philosopher attributed to him, or I forget how it goes, but you know that you know nothing. Well, G.C. Selden in the psychology of the stock market, which I have the little pamphlet, it's just a, it's a little tiny book here. You can actually get it uh, online for free. And if you want the pamphlet, go to books to read on my website. But G.C. Selden said the Socratic method applied to markets, the trader would do very well paraphrasing him. If the trader applied the Socratic methods to market, he would do really well. And I think the Socratic method is definitely some fodder for research. But from what I understand, what little research I've done on Socrates is that you basically question everything. You don't you don't say, I know this. He's like, well, how do I know this? And why do I know this? And for me, it's doing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of empirical research. When you are learning, even if you have been around for a long time and you're fairly smart in the markets, you got to be careful when you're connecting the dots. So you might be able to correctly connect those dots, but that could be very dangerous. Now, I have to warn you, if you email me, be prepared to let me make an example of you or use you as fodder for my presentations. So I'm not picking on anyone in particular, although it may seem like it. I just like to use current examples and examples from people that I've corresponded with over the years. And somewhere I think there's a little... Disclaimer saying that if you email me, I could use your email. I'm not going to use your real name unless you tell me it's okay. Anyway, I got an email about AMD. Interesting. AMD has been unbelievable, but could be at the end. Well, I got this email the day before AMD peaked. And what did I say as a trend following moron? I said, well, Donnie Think Vacuum. That's slow Donnie. Do a YouTube on him. It was in the... I'm not a big fan of sitcoms, but this one episode was funny as heck. <laughs> I forget this guy's name. He could be a pain in the butt, but he could be funny also. Anyway, he's slow Donnie. He's pretending to be mentally challenged. And he often says, Donnie Think Vacuum. And when uh, my wife and I are working on something, you know, Donnie Think Phillips Screwdriver. It's like... My wife will say, I need a, uh, I'll say, she says, you need a, you need a, a regular screwdriver, a flat blade. And I'm like, Donnie think Phillips screwdriver, you know, we'll kind of go back and forth on that. And sometimes she's right. <laughs> anyway, he came back with confusing the issue with facts. Five times sales makes no sense. So many shares controlled by powers at B that paid under two bucks. Well, He's probably right, but what is, is it's going up. But then what happened? Well, the stock begins to implode. So 
he possibly has just been trained to look for stocks with, with no more than five times sales and shares controlled by powers that be, et cetera, okay? Now, if you're going to make that your methodology, fine, but show me 100 examples of that and then find as many examples as you can where it doesn't work. Become your own devil's advocate, obviously. Now, I know as I'm giving this presentation, I'm sort of realizing that this once it rolls over and once you have the bow tie and once you have the first thrust, then yes, yeah, something like AMD would fit nicely into the go-go no-mo strategy, which basically you're looking for a bow tie, first thrust, or other transitional pattern in a very thick, efficient type of stock that's priced for perfection. But that's another system altogether, and that system is still technical analysis based. The signal comes from technical analysis. You're just backing it a little bit with a few little caveats. But to short a market that's going up because of poor fundamentals is a bad idea. Write that down. Now, as I said a few weeks back, getting back to the basics and can you be successful with them, there are tons of people who could be great, but they don't practice the basics. They don't want to work at it. And the life of the trader has often been equated to the life of an athlete. Um, we are probably a lot pudgier than most athletes, so not in that realm. But in a lot of the mental aspects, there is a lot of things that, is, that are the same. And I noticed that I'd forgotten this quote came from a book called The Trading Athlete, which I don't remember in a lot of details, but I do remember getting a few good things out of it. So it's probably worth reading. And as I often say, trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. I am guilty as charged. I occasionally try to make it more difficult than it needs to be. Now, I don't want to be shot on Friday, and I did kind of beat the dead horse in this example, but I'll give you exhibit A of making it harder than it needs to be. Bill Ackman started buying VRX. In the 150s. And he wrote it up to well over $200 a share. So he had pretty huge gains in this stock. Better than a poke in the eye. And then what happened? Well, he, hold on, he held on for a, a $4.1 billion loss. And then he sold way down there. So did I do that? Well, I don't want to be shot on Friday, but a little money management or just one of these simple little systems that I preach about would have kept you out of a lot of trouble. Yes, hindsight's twenty twenty, but a stop in place and not fighting the trend and getting out when the trend has obviously turned, he would have made good money on this position. I'll show you a few examples in just one second, or one in particular where simple money management was a, was a difference between a winning trade and losing trade. Now, this was from a year or two ago, but I remember there was a guru and he was driving me crazy and he kept putting out post after post after post after post after post that the market was topping. And then we had one bad day in the market, and then he said, told you. Well, how much money did he lose on every one of his predictions? Well, none, because he's obviously not following his own predictions. If he was following his own predictions, then he'd realize that he was crazy and his system, his guru top picking system did not work. So the S&Ps obviously went up a lot further from here, and he was wrong in calling that top when he did. Margin call. Why don't you just unplug your phone? Well, I'll never remember to plug it back in if I do that. <laughs> So 
So as we used to joke way back in the hedge. Stop it. How many times I have to tell you I do a show every day? Every Thursday. <laughs> as I used to say back, as we used to say in the hedge fund days, jokingly predict early and often. So be careful with that. Obviously, this gentleman has made trading a lot more difficult than it really needs to be. Now, it's not, diff not as difficult as you try to make it. The only way to profit from a trade is to capture a trend. So getting back to poor Mr. Ackman, I probably should stop picking on him, but he obviously, he, he captured a trend. He did really well, but he then began to fight the trend. Now, I know that's a Captain Obvious statement. The only way to profit from a trade is to capture a trend, but you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends and throw those basics right out the window. So obviously, if a market is at point A and you buy it and it goes up to point B, from A to B is a trend. You can connect a big blue arrow between the two. And your profit, obviously, is B minus A. I know. Now, obviously, you'll need a methodology. You want to start with the big blue arrows and build. And what amazes me is something as simple as a TKO or a persistent pullback or ideally a TKO with a persistent pullback could work quite well. And the combination of, of those two are my absolute favorite setup. So when you see something that makes a persistent move higher and has a TKO, sometimes if the TKO is big enough, you can get in right above the high. Stop goes right above the low. If you're following a money management, you add that. I'm sorry, if you're following a money management, you subtract that from that. And then put it up here. And that becomes your profit target, your initial profit target. Sometimes it could be that simple. And sometimes it could be that obvious, okay? Forget about the stochastic and the wave count and the Fibonacci and the counting of the waves and all those other things I talked about imitating Arnold, telling everybody the problems with becoming a successful trader. Now, once you gain a little experience, then something like a bow tie can help you trade emerging trends. Obviously, with the market potentially rolling over now, we're going to talk about bow ties. You can see in a case like this, you had a buy signal after a bow tie, and then we put in a stop, we take partial profits, and then we trail the stop higher. Very simple, straightforward stuff. Now, I said I'd quit picking on Mr. Ackman, but I can't help myself. A weekly bow tie would have saved him $4 billion. Now, I know hindsight's 2020, but if you're following a system, then you can make a case of foresight and hindsight. So I am following a system that uses bow ties, and I came up with bow ties long, long, long before Mr. Ackman took this trade. And you could see that they even had a weekly bow tie. So even if he held on until they had a weekly sell signal, he would have saved billions and billions and billions of dollars, maybe even profited from the trade overall. Well, actually, he wouldn't have profited from it. But we saved, he would have saved a few billion, a billion here, a billion there. Now, obviously, you need a little money in position management. As I've said before, there used to be a tire salesman named Sam Bear. And he would come on TV and he'd tell it like it is. Tires ain't pretty. Tires don't smell good. But you got to have them. And if you got to have them, you might as well buy them from Allied Tires. Well, I agree with Mr. Bear. Applied to markets. Money management ain't sexy, but you got to have it. As I often say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. There's some long stories there. But just know that if you're trading at the right size from both a psychological perspective and a monetary perspective, it's going to help you out tremendously. Each loss, yes, you'll still have a, an F-bomb or two, as I do. I'm trying to get better. 
but you're not going to be devastated and wiped out. You could survive frustration. You'll still be frustrated, but you won't be devastated. You can't survive devastation. So the simplest thing to always ask yourself is where would you be wrong as a trend follower? Well, Mr. Ackman, I well, said I'd stop picking on him, poor guy. Mr. Ackman was obviously wrong. Now, he wasn't, you didn't have to wait until he was way down here. 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion, 4.1 billion. You know, he could have stopped way up here somewhere, only losing 1 billion, or maybe even if you go back to the original chart, I think he would have even been profitable with a fairly loose stop on the trade. So without going into a lot of details, just keep your money management real simple. Just simple things like if you buy a stock and it comes right back into the base, you are wrong. If you're buying something like a bow tie and a stock is coming off of major, major, major lows and that stock goes back to those major, major, major lows, then you are wrong. Now, there's plenty of examples of this, but you get the idea. Somebody once said, stops kill. <laughs> okay, well, that'll work until it don't. Sometimes you have to get out the way. Now, sometimes you have to get out the way when you're losing open profits. There's nothing wrong with that. Like Mr. Ackman, he could have gotten out the way and made a lot of money, a few billion maybe. Okay? Now, here's just one example, and this happens quite often. But we took partial profits at 21%. We trailed the stop higher. We got stopped out. Okay? Now, there's no guarantee. Sooner or later, you're, you're going to get whacked on the downside. Okay? It happens with the silent SH. I, I want to make sure that this video doesn't get demonetized. But sooner or later, yeah, you'll get this big adverse move against you and you'll have to deal with it. But more often than not, you'll get stopped out before big trouble okay as i often preach it's always darkest right before it gets more dark so a lot of times think about it you're in a position it's going down it's going down it's going down well it's going down so far how much further can it go a lot it can go to zero well i can't sell down i'm down too much well that sunk cost fallacy will get you in a lot of trouble now on a positive note, without going into a lot of details, obviously, we take the swing trade profit out with the hopes of it turning into a longer-term trade, and then we trail that stop higher. Sometimes it works as far as you get the swing trade, and then you get the longer-term trade, and sometimes you don't. At least you get the swing trade out, as I often say, better than the poke in the eye. Now, obviously, you're going to need a little bit of psychology. And this is the section that gets bigger and bigger. The psychology section and the holistic trader under the members area are growing by leaps and bounds. And I, and I have so much material to put in. And every day, I just it's just like keep uncovering more and more things that I want to put into those section. And as I often say, if I had somebody who wanted to learn trading and was new to trading, or if I could go back more importantly and talk to that young punk version of me, I would say study psychology really hard and then learn how to trade, okay? And then mix that psychology in with the trading. In the learning management system, you'll notice we have mind, members mindset, and then we have the methodology, and then we have money management, and also the holistic trader, which is a little bit of all four, or all three, I should say, mind, money management, methodology. Well, I suggest you go through those Take all courses simultaneously because as you learn about the methodology, you learn about the psychology involved. And as you learn about the money management, you learn there's a psychology involved with that. And then the three are all intertwined. Now, as I preach, the battle is often from within. The Pogo comic, we have met the enemy and he is us, comes to mind. The beauty of trading psychology, even though I have... I have literally a, a, a huge bin, which is almost, which is actually too, it's going to be too big to move. But I have a book, a, a huge bin full of about 50 or 60 books that I plan on reading in psychology. I have eight psychology journals. 
plus a couple of, of biography books, two out of about 10 that I plan on reading. I have two now. I plan on reading all 10 of them. So I have tons and tons of, of work ahead of me, and I've done years and years of work so far when it comes to trading psychology. But the bottom line is, if I had to boil it all down, and there's some neurology involved and, and physiology and things like that, but if you boil it all down, once you get a little experience, you know what you're doing wrong. And as I said ad nauseum, when somebody calls me, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. It's like, well, okay, um, what do you think you're doing wrong? Well, I'm not honoring my stops. You know, they immediately tell me. And when they don't, what happens? I know I've said it ad nauseum. I can look at their trades and pretty quickly tell them what they're doing wrong. And what do they say? Well, I know, I know, I know. Livermore years ago said a stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. How many times have we done that? I'm coming into this show, all right? Confession time. I'm coming into this show. I'm watching the S&Ps. Let me see where they are. I'm watching them drop down hard, and all of a sudden I see them begin to reverse. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to go in and make a little day trade. And what I did was, and I think I have a slide on this further down, but I said, wait a minute, Dave. What? were your trading goals that you set? What were your trading goals that you read every day when you're putting content into this learning management system? And basically it said that I will not take any unplanned trades with one minor exception. And the market was not that one minor, minor exception. So I recognized that I was getting ready to make an ego-based trade. And I found myself trying to justify and say, well, I'm a trader. OK, market's down hard. I'm going to go in and just kind of fade that little trend a little bit. And I said, no, no, stop. Read your own stuff. Do your own stuff. So, again, you know what you're doing wrong? Well, you know what you're doing wrong. And I'd like to give credit to this. I found this picture a few years back. and It's just the funniest thing ever. <laughs> There's your problem. So I don't know who took this originally, but if somebody finds a original source, please let me know. So as I say over and over again, the solution is simple. Don't do that. My work is done. Might have a drop the mic moment. <laughs> and it is that simple. The definition of insanity, as Einstein once said, is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Now, I'm not talking about taking a few trades and then going right back to the market and taking a few more trades if they're trades that should be taken what i'm talking about is not honoring your stop losing a whole lot of money not honoring your stop losing a whole lot of money and doing that over and over again and know that you're doing that so that's if i had to wrap up trading psychology that's pretty much it you know what you're doing wrong what you're doing anyway now where all this so so, Dave, why are you reading eight psycho psychology journals and 50 books and all this other stuff? Well, what I found is as you learn why we do things, it makes them a lot easier to accept them. This morning when I felt that urge, I was able to recognize that that's a psychological urge based on my need for action, okay, and things like that. And it's a, it, it can get a lot deeper. And until you, as I often say, until you know the whys, W-H-Y-S, and until you become wise, W-I-S-E, or know the whys, W-I-S-E, sometimes you just have to do things, and then later down the road, you figure out why you felt that, that urge to do the wrong thing. So can you be successful with just the basics? Yes. At the very least, you could be better than the gurus and egotistical Money management. So start small, just one pattern. Leo Melamed once said, be a lover, not a fighter. Amen, my brother from another mother. Plan your trade, trade your plan. How many times have we heard that? Okay. How many times do you actually do that? You don't have to answer. Risk a little bit on each trade, 2% max. Don't be a hero. Don't have an ego. I got a little further ahead of myself. This was my ego story. Just this morning, I almost took a trade. Now, 
I can't say for sure, but I think this really helped me out. I had this screen up. These are my trading goals that I set with my own program that I published to take only the best opportunities. And when it has nothing to do, do nothing. Once I do find an opportunity, I will carefully plan that trade and then follow the plan. I will resist the urge to micromanage day trade. Okay, I was to throw a day trade out. I'm like, oh, well, you know, so what? I could risk a little bit and maybe just make a little money. No, that's not what I do. If that's what if that's what you do every day, then do that. Okay, and be good at it and make that your livelihood. Or take any unplanned trades with the exception of a money line in the corner, S&G, Ogre type of trade. Okay, now that's just an Ogre trade is, let's say, Market's way oversold like it is now. We come in futures are like way down here. And I'm looking to take a very small risk, take a very small position, and then try to capture that move going higher. So that would be an unplanned trade because there's no way I'm going to know the night before. Well, I will know that what I will know the night before if is that if the market's way down here, we might get that big gap lower and then we'd see a major reversal. But that's just what I call an S and G type of trade. That's not the bread and butter. You make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. Got a little egotistical in my last one that I made, and I lost a little bit of money. And every time I open up one particular account where I made that trade, I'm faced with a loss for a year in that account. It's a small account. It's no big deal. But it still eats away at me that I did something that I shouldn't have done, and it's a constant reminder. And then having your trading goals always set is a constant reminder. And I think that this actually saved me from making a stupid little day trade this morning. Now, easier said than done. I know that. Reminds me of in Pulp Fiction when Marcellus Wallace was, I guess, chastising or whatever you call it. It was preaching to the little, to the finer Bru fighter Bruce Willis. <laughs> You ever notice he's, he makes like one face in every movie, and that's how it became popular. Anyway, he's pretty good in this one, I have to admit. And paraphrasing him, the day of the trade, you might feel a slight sting. That's pride effing with you. F pride. Pride only hurts and never helps. You fight through that S, okay? And it's easier said than done, but if you can kind of – I like kind of making a game out of things and being silly – and that's one way for me to not go crazy in this business. And so it's like when I feel the urge to, to micromanage or do something I shouldn't do, I force myself to recognize that, wait a minute, I'm doing something kind of stupid here. And it doesn't take some big, long-term psychological, um, what would you call it, therapy all it might take sometimes is say, wait a minute, let me just take a deep breath, pause for a few seconds and ask myself, am I trying to force something to happen? Is this a trade outside of my plan? And if I just can't resist it, then by all means do it. But 99 and hundred times, if you take that time to do that little bit of introspection, to, to see whether or not you're actually violating your plan or doing something off the cuff, you're going to avoid doing it. All right, just real quick. The learning management system, believe it or not, is finally up and running. I know I've been talking about it for about a year. <laughs> it's been up and running for Trading Full Circle, but I've got it uh, up and running for all the members' courses. And just real quick, what I'm such a nerd, but what's exciting about this is we could track progress. And I've got a couple of complete newbies that have joined up. And I'm really excited about them. I'm anxious to see what's going to come out the other side of this. And I'm, I know I'm a nerd, but it's going to be awesome, I think. But if I see somebody who is risking too much money in the markets and they're complaining to me about their big losses, I can come in here and say, well, wait a minute. You haven't finished money management. Finish that before you risk any more money. Or maybe their stock selection could use a little help. Well, you haven't finished the methodology. Finish that before you make any more trades. Anyway, I know I'm a nerd. A couple of bonuses in there, 911 calls and private consulting and other things and other earned credits, such as all the books. And then eventually, if you stick with it, 
just so you'll have everything that I've ever published in the world, you'll get all of the premium content. So check that out, davelandry.com slash members. Okay. All right, lots of questions coming in. Any irony, I believe the point is people who are too stupid to understand that they're too stupid. Yeah, yeah, it's, and that's the big, that's the big dilemma is, and it's it's so humbling when you finally get it. And that's why I'm always out here saying, I mean, I could sell so much more educational products if I just said, oh, man, you can make all this money and, and so can you and blah, blah, blah. And, or I can, I made as many, all this money and so can you. And it was so easy. Well, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. It's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it, though. And that's the bottom line. But yeah, it's pretty humbling when you're coming down that what you think you know slope. <laughs> so, Sergeant Schlutz was a smart character. He knew nothing. I know nothing. Herbalife, Pershing Square 2. I don't know what that is. Is that a stock you want to look at? Herbalife, Pershing Square. I'm not sure what that is. All right, let's hop into the charts. Obviously, you guys are probably just... Eyes are glazing over, waiting to get to the charts. Herbalife Pershing Square. I don't know what that means. Enlighten me. See, I don't know. I don't know, and I don't know that I don't know. I know that I don't know. All right, let's take a look at the piece. Well, there's the spiders first, just to get a, a true opening. You can see we did gap low this morning. We did shoot lower, and now we're bouncing off of those lows just for s and g's let's see where we are on an hourly basis as one of you pointed out recently um all these indices have a uh, bow tie down on an hourly basis yes and when you do see a bow tie not you want to rush out and trade hourly bow ties but when you do see an hourly bow tie for major highs you probably want to pay attention but yeah, it looks like we're a long ways away from an hourly bow tie back up. Now let's get back to the daily. This is the 50 day moving average. A lot of times, as I say, you'll get a bow tie fulcrum right at the 50 day moving average. That could be a pretty powerful pattern, okay? Let's add in the 200 day moving average. Oh, Ackman owns Pershing, okay? Pershing SQ, I don't know. Give me a symbol. Nine out of ten times, I don't even know what the name of the stock is. Okay, uh, SP, oops, 200. So let's put a 208 moving average in here, and then let's change back to the cash market. So 208 moving average, believe it or not, I didn't realize this until I just plotted this, we are actually trading below the 200-day moving average. Nothing magical about that, but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market, especially if you use something like Dave Light. We have had no downside Dave Light on a daily basis in the 200-day moving average since 2016. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. So this entire uptrend even though we had a few little intersections in here, has been contained by the 200-day moving average. Nothing magical about that. Don't rush out and trade that as a system in and of itself, but certainly pay attention to that system, and that might keep you out of trouble. I was in Asia a few years back, and Asian markets were down 30%, and so was this gentleman. Well, I guarantee you it went through the 50 and the 200 long before it was down 30-something percent, as he also was, and he claimed to be a trader. Now, I'm picking on him, but same thing happens in Germany and wherever else I've been. Human nature is human nature. All right, let's take a look at a weekly chart. On a weekly basis, the market still looks okay. Doesn't look too bad. And this is that 50-week moving average. Let's see where we are percentage-wise. We're only down, I know, only. We're only down 6% from that closing high. So that's not too bad if you think about it. And what was the system earlier? 10%. So we still got a little ways to go. Now, this doesn't mean that you hold on to the longs that you're long. The model portfolio right now is completely flat. We do have three stocks we're looking at on the long side. 
but they haven't triggered yet and they might never trigger. So on your stops and get out the way. Again, he who fights and runs away loses a fight another day. But pay attention to this system for a possible longer term timing signal. Pershing Square Capital had a match versus Call Icon and Icon 1. Okay. Let's take a look at the piece. Let's take a look. I want to show you some death and destruction here in one second. It's kind of scary. All right, so here's the actual cash S&P market, but same sort of everything pretty much applies. On a daily basis, we're down below the 200, just dip below it, had been below it since when? 2016. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. And then let me go over to the major MIGs. The major MIGs are really, really ugly, and that's got me really concerned. So I don't want you to think just because we haven't, we don't have sell signals in this market timing system that I'm not concerned about the market. Because take a look at the NASDAQ. You have a bow tie down in the NASDAQ. Now it just triggered a little later. Or it's not, let's see how it sets up. It in the in the Russell 2000, it's set up perfectly. Yeah, so it really isn't, it really hasn't set up just yet. So if we bounce in here, we're gonna have a daily bow tie sell signal in the nasdaq nasdaq looking pretty ugly well below its 200 day moving average as we are today when's the last time it went below its 200 day moving average or last time we didn't have daylight look at that going all the way back 2016 how cool is that yeah there's been some zigs and zags along the way but you get the idea now russell 2000 is the ugliest of them all Russell 2000 triggered a daily bow tie sell signal when? One, two, three, four, five, six days ago. And so far, it's been a bit of a route lower. Let's measure from this daily peak to where we are. We're right at about almost 10%. So if you're, if you're looking at a 10% system, let's put a weekly in here. It closed below the 50-week moving average, and you're closing in on 10% from all-time highs so it's getting pretty close to a sell signal so at the least that should make you pull your horns in now let's take a look at some of this sector action in alphabetical order i suppose let's see let's go by alphabetical order or no particular order. it doesn't matter chemicals breaking down bow tie down computer hardware getting ready to bow tie down breaking down not far from the 200 or on its way to the 200 I should say Software, not far from the 200, bow tying down. Conglomerates, beginning to drop out of bed. Durables, sliding as you can see. Non-durables, sliding as you can see. So the list goes on and on. There's a few I want to point out. Semiconductors have been abysmal as of late, and that's a little bit of a bummer. I'm a huge fan of the semis confirming what you're seeing in the overall market. Semis look like they're in trouble. Now, the energies have been doing okay, but looks like they're getting thrown out with the bathwater now. You see energies broke out nicely just a few, just about a week ago or so, and now they've come right back in. Another cause for concern. Now, financials, I don't like looking at that financial. That basically just mirrors a lot of different funds, but if you take a look at XLF and financials, it gives you a true picture of what's happening. Financials beginning to break down. Let's take a look at you know food and beverage. Not a whole lot of trading there, but beginning to break down. Health services, longer term uptrend, but beginning to get in trouble in here. Insurance breaking down. So the list goes on and on. Just look no further than these major MIGs. Manufacturing construction. Retail. Retail is a little concerning in here. Retail. One of your stronger areas beginning to break down. As I often say, relative strength and momentum, or trading relative strength, trading momentum based on relative strength, looking for the hottest sector or sectors and staying along those sectors is a really good way to trade. Unfortunately, momentum ends badly. If 
years ago, I spent a few years researching buying new highs in these more volatile issues, especially when they bought, made highs on, a, on an expansion of range, and it absolutely printed money. I called it the Landry 100. It was a lot of work to maintain, and it wasn't actually being traded. I had a fund that was looking at me and wanted to to do this type of trading, this momentum, wanted me to maintain these momentum lists for him. And it just never materialized. And it was just personal reasons with this gentleman. He just wanted to trade his own stuff. I think he, he didn't want to get back into money management, but he was kind of noodling with it. Anyway, long story endless, it pretty much printed money for quite a while, but occasionally ends badly. And I guarantee you that those 100 momentum stocks coming into the sell-off would have gotten whacked really hard. And as I've said before, if I could solve for that, that big implosion in the end, you'd never see my fat arse again. I actually told that to Mike Booty was showing a momentum type of system once at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting, as I often say, and I actually told Mike that. And then his, his reply, I don't know, I've said this a thousand times, but his reply was like, Dave, he's kind of low key. If you're going to have a baby, you're going to have baby poop. <laughs> now, babies are kind of cool and neat, but they come with a lot of poop. Well, if you're going to trade momentum, especially stocks that are going straight up, that's a great way to trade, but eventually it will end badly. And again, if I could solve for that, see you. No, i come back and taunt you a second time. So anyway, as we finish up these sectors, it's just ugly. Let's take a look at bonds, and then I want to look at uh, gold and silver real quick. And then we'll pop out, uh, start asking about individual question, uh, stocks if you want. So bonds have been a route lower. As I preach, it's not the actual interest rate. It's the delta in rates which freaks everybody out or the change. And obviously, we've had a pretty big change in recent times. We took out these multi-year lows. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Let's just go ahead and get a clean chart here. And then... Uh, keep asking about individual stocks, and we'll get to those in just one second. So here's the weekly bonds. If we back the chart way, 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 way out, we could see that we have taken out these multi-month, I'm sorry, multi-year lows, and it's looking a little ugly in here. So now um, somebody was came out to look at the house yesterday. We're selling our house, and uh, she's like, the stock market's been doing really good, huh? And I'm like, uh, you haven't seen it today, have you? <laughs> She's like, well, what caused that? Interest rates? I'm like, well, it might be blamed to that, but you can't always connect the dots. And anyway, so the man on the street obviously has taken notice, and that's usually an interesting sign. Let's take a look at gold real quick, and then um, we'll get to your questions and stocks. Now, the good news is gold is finally getting a bid. OK, I was a little nervous last few days because the market's falling out of bed and gold's not doing anything. So what that where that why that scares me is if there's no flight to safety, if the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater, maybe that's a bad analogy. Let me rewind that. If there's no flight to safety, if people aren't rushing to bonds or gold or something other than stocks to put some money in but rather selling those markets or certainly not buying them, then, it's, it, then it becomes what's known as a liquidation type market. At least today, you're seeing a little money go into gold, which means there's a little bit money left, okay? So I think this is very encouraging that gold has rallied. I got a Facebook message. Somebody asked me about, should they buy silver because it's going up? It's like, it's not going up, you know? Today it is, but two days ago or three days ago when they asked me, it was actually dropping. So, no. And then all those idiots on TV, I believe that silver will go up 200%. Like, okay, well, put all your money. They don't sound like Grover, but that's my invitation of them. You know, draw your big blue arrow, you idiot. Ackman owns Pershing SQ. I don't know what that is. Pershing, P-E-R, Pershing, Pershing Gold, Pershing Gold. I don't know what that is. Give me a symbol. Donnie needs symbols. 
Pershing Square Capital had a match versus Call of Icon, Icon 1. Okay. None of the major indices on a weekly basis have bow tied down. And then he adds the caveat yet. That is correct. And I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to point that out earlier. Let's go back to the P's. I know I bored. I actually had a few people ask me, stop showing that chart every week. So I quit showing it so much. But you had a bow tie down in 2000, a bow tie up in 2003, a bow tie down in 2007, very early 2008, a bow tie up when? 2009. Okay. We did have one, this signal isn't a major signal because it's not of all time highs, but we did have one little blip in here. And you know, the Russell 2000 dropped about 18% from that one little blip on a weekly chart. So do pay attention to that in addition to the 10% system. But we're a ways away from a bow tie down. Now keep in mind that a moving average will have a lot of lag to it. That's why something that's price-based, even though I love my bow ties, they're sacred to me, but I have to admit that simple little 10% system might be a little bit more, I don't know if the word's robust, but it's certainly going to be quicker to trigger than something like a bow tie on a weekly basis, a drill statement. But yes, if we bow tie down up to all-time highs, now this, it doesn't always work. There's no guarantee. Whips are or what? Frustrating. Bear markets are what? Devastating. No guarantee we're going to have a bear market, but you better be careful, okay? Go out and buy some guns and uh, food. Oh, Pershing's the name of hedge fund. Thank you, guy. Yeah, you know, I don't watch a lot of news. I mean, I do, uh, admittedly, I'll turn on a little news with all the crap that's going on lately. Uh, when I go in the house for lunch, sometimes I'll turn on the news just to have some background noise or whatever, just to see what's going on. But, yeah, I really don't pay attention especially financial-wise, what's happening. I used to keep it on in my office all the time. It's, I got a TV now. I disconnected it a while back, and it hadn't been on probably six months. NBEV, that's going to be a beverage company, correct? Um, it's kind of all over the place, okay? Look at the HV. HV is 288. That's a little ludicrous for, even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, okay? And it went from two to nine, and under stock selection, I talk about the fact that you have these bottle rockets, which are a bottle rocket for you non-Southerners or non-redneck type. I'm a little bit of both. <laughs> Is this little firework, and they take off like they could go to the moon, and then they they pop, and they kind of, oh, yeah, that was that was fun. But, you know, you put about a 1,000 of them together in a big can, then you got something. But that's another story altogether. Anyway, the point with why I call them a bottle rocket is because they fizzle out real quick. So if you got a stock goes from 2 to 9, that's a, what, 500% move or whatever over a short period of time. It's just too crazy to trade. So I would leave that one alone. Let's take a look at it longer term just for S&Gs. Yeah, I'd leave that one alone. It's all over the place. Too dangerous, Christopher. All right, Guy says, ABX had a bow tie the other day. If you just found this and not long, would you still enter here? Good question. ABX. Okay, ABX is a gold stock. Uh, my quick answer is no, and I'll show you why. So it's sort of bow tying in here. Not bad. Now, keep in mind with these commodity stocks, they're not going to set up perfectly, okay? And the reason I would not take it is because if you look right above the market, you have a big mound of overhead resistance. And a lot of the metals are going to look like that, okay? So good eye in finding a stock that appears to have bottomed out. Unfortunately, it's going to run into trouble fairly quickly. How about IGC for a bottle rocket? That's a crazy one. Now, a bottle rocket is not a tradable pattern. A bottle rocket is something you want to avoid. But, yeah, great point on that. Um, I was watching this one in pretty much amazement. I think they I think they added the word cannabis to the name or something, and then it just went crazy. But I am keeping an eye on those cannabis stocks, obviously, just in case. <laughs> okay, any more? We've got a few minutes left. 
All right, while we're on impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Oh, by the way, I do have a free course I just added to the members area, davelander.com slash members. And you can start with the free course. If you get through that and you take all the quizzes and you like what you hear, then you're going to really love the rest of it. If you don't, then maybe not so much. But give it a shot. It's free. All right, we got one last one. Uh, question on the chandelier exit. Have you used it like it? No, I don't. I don't use a chandelier exit. Um, somebody asked me about that years ago, and I think it might have been somebody actually wrote about it recently in Proactive Advisor magazine, which that's the magazine I published that system in. Um, if memory serves, it's going to look a lot like any type of trend following exit is going to look a lot like my own money management in my own trailing stops. And a lot of times people look at my trailing stops when I draw them on a chart and it's like, that looks like a longer term moving average. And a lot of times they will look like a longer term moving average. One thing I needled with years ago is like, what would, what would happen if you took a, let's say start off with a 10 day exponential and then went to a 20 and 30 and 40 and kept going higher and you're moving averages until you reach some sort of critical mass and then followed the market higher with that. Well, that would work, except that sometimes markets have long consolidation periods and your stop would be tightening throughout. Now, from a system design standpoint, maybe there's a reason why you'd want that to happen. From the way I look at markets, I would say, no, let's not do that. So the ch with the chandelier, chandelier? With, the, with the chandelier stop, I think it continues to tighten as the market continues, uh, even if the market goes sideways. So experiment with it, play with it. But I think it's going to end up looking like something that we're already doing. And then I would suggest, and this is just my own opinion, obviously. I hate when people say in my opinion. You know, it's like, uh, do you give opinions for others? <laughs> um, but in my opinion, I prefer just leaving a stop where it is while the market consolidates. And that's getting back to that box thing I was talking about. One thing I was discussing when talking about Darvis style boxes under stock selection is that sometimes if you're trading a TKO or maybe like a bow tie, get you in like really early into a stock that later turns out to be a box stock. If there was a way to identify these box stocks ahead of time, these Darvis box stocks, how I made two million in the stock market, I packed away my book. I'm kind of angry that I packed that one away because I'd like to reread it and see what's in there. But from what I remember, it was a good book. And he talked about these stocks that build boxes on top of boxes. And that's a great way to to trade. But I think that you can't just trade it uh, like that because it, trend following, longer term trend following does have some issues. And that's why I think it's more important to find that swing trade and then have it turn into a box stock. I know I'm turning it into a whole new lesson. But, yeah, um, getting back to your chandelier stops, I, I don't use them, but you might want to uh, certainly can check them out. SQ as a short. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is getting kind of crazy, kind of fast. You know, this is one of my, one of the things, I'm glad you brought this one up. One of the things that I talk about is, as a trend follower, you say, okay, trends, trends, I'm not going to say when the trend ends because I'm a trend follower, but you, of course, have a chair ready for when it does. But in a case of a stock like this, if you're looking to buy this stock up in the 90s, you have to wonder if it's price for perfection because it's ran so far for so long. And then this is a little bit of case in point. You could see that it's beginning to implode pretty seriously in here. So yeah, maybe on a bounce, it could certainly set up as a bow tie. Uh, that's what I call a forced bow tie when it slides through it and the bow ties change quickly. And then uh, it'll also set up as a first thrust on the short side. It's, it's going to be a little bit dangerous to short something like that. I'd much prefer like a big, thick uh, retail type of stock or something like that. CRMD is a long. Good, uh, good questions today. Um, this one is on my watch list, and I'd recommend you put it on your watch list. A couple things. Volatility is kind of nutso at 131. But yeah, I think it's got it's made a huge longer term bottom. It's it does have some Phoenix characteristics to it, even though it's ran quite a bit. It's only at a buck and change, and it could possibly go all the way back to its old highs. That's the whole idea with the Phoenix strategy. Some overhead problems to deal with, but that's going back a few years. 
yeah, I think uh, keep an eye on this one. Like I said, it is on my momentum list. Wait for the next pullback, though. I wouldn't just jump in blindly unless you want to use a dollar and sixty cents stop. <laughs> then by all means, knock yourself out. I'm kidding. Put SQ on a log scale broken LT chart. Yeah, I I don't doubt that at all. That's something I was uh, just editing a video on recently. Logarithmic. You might have been in that webinar, Phil. It was in stock selection webinar. Um, it might have been you talking about the logarithmic charts. But yeah, absolutely. You know, when you do get it, I, I hear you. If you want to go long, long term, something like SQ. And I didn't realize it when I first got teach TC. But when you go to the weekly charts, it automatically switches you over to log. But yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. It's beginning to break that longer term trend. Mother of all uptrends on that one. All good things must come to an end. Climatic looks like a V-top. Yeah, I hear you. You're welcome, guy. Thanks for coming. All right. A net. Can we talk about that one? Another whoosh. Yeah. It's kind of a crazy stock, but it had that last little last gasp higher. And see, this might be a good short. It could be a little thicker for a short, but it's not bad. But the thing is, it's going to have a tremendous amount of overhead supply to get through. So looking at it longer term, that's what you want to trade like this. But if you were to short this stock on a bounce, maybe if it bounced up to, let's say, 237 or so, it should not come back into this overhead supply. So you've got a lot of overhead supply to work with. You can put a stop in somewhere above that resistance. And that would be a place where you're wrong. Then, yeah, by all means, on a bounce, okay? Sorry if you've gone over this. If your time horizon is three to six months, what mechanical stop would you suggest? I would not suggest using a mechanical stop. If you go, just go through the money management guy. It's all in there. But what I do is I eyeball the short-term volatility. Some people ask me. If I'm using ATR, the answer is no. But yes, if you if you try to quantify it, it's going to be a little bit ATR-ish. One of the problems with quantifying volatility to set a stop is that if you really look at the statistics, that stop's going to be like really, really, really wide to survive that short-term volatility. So I eyeball it. If it's bouncing around three or four points a day, I know my stop has to be outside of that noise. Okay. And then to make the transition to longer term trade after I get my swing trade piece off, if I'm blessed with that, my stop goes to break even. And then longer term, let's say I started off with a four point stop. Well, that stop might slowly widen out to be a much longer term stop. Now, I'm giving you like a quick cra crash course here. But the reason that stop widens out is twofold. One if I caught the trend properly, the volatility of that market is increasing. And two, in order to ride out longer term trends, you're going to need a wider and wider stop. Now you're thinking, well, why not just trade longer term trends to begin with? Well, your, your success rate is going to be abysmal. You're going to be wrong about 72 or more percent of the time. I know statistics are worthless. Everybody knows that. So you're not going to be wrong, right that much. But by taking a hybrid approach with the money management and getting that swing trade out, you're positioning yourself to put a little money in the bank when you're right small and then still be able to make big money when you're right big and to mitigate somewhat. Now, I haven't eliminated them. Again, if I figure that out, you'd never see me again. But it helps mitigate somewhat those drawdowns, okay? Invax. Um, this one's not really jumping out at me. Yeah, here's the problem. It's got this big gap down, okay? I think my Cajun just slipped out. It's got a big gap down. <laughs> People say, you Cajun? I never hear it. It's like yeah, every now and then it slips out. So this market has a lot of bad memories. I know if it got pushed into the gap, it'd be a good problem to have. But it's just kind of all over the place and a big gap down, so I would avoid it based on that. Oh, you're welcome, Guy. Yeah, and, you know, if you want to, uh, Guy, feel free to uh, put those questions into the system, and I'll make complete presentations on them. I'd be happy to do that.
I have clients that don't want to bother with the wiggles and stay with the big sector and stock trend. <laughs> wiggles, yeah. I'm not sure exactly where you're going with that. Like they don't want to, um, <laughs> they don't want to, uh, <laughs> they want to just buy and hold. Well, as I preach, buy and hold will work until it don't. And I think we might be in one of those it don't times. And again, hate to use the word hope, but I hope not. Well, look, we're out of time. Um, again, thank you for being here today. Great group today. Uh, nice. Uh, we nearly filled the room, which is always exciting. So thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And then uh, possibly, uh, or hopefully I should say, we'll see all you guys and girls again next time. Thank you so much.